hey, today, so we, I, I, I don't know how this service is going to end. We're just going to uh, today kind of go with the flow. Uh, this is Pentecost Sunday. And uh, so I'm going to get into the message really quick. Uh, the title, if you're taking notes for my message, is Pentecost, Justice, and Racism. Pentecost, Justice, and Racism. Uh, so we're going to go to Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to read about 13 verses. And it, can someone help me preach today? I need some helpers. How many helpers can, can help me preach? Like 80 of you? I need more than 80 of you, right? Okay. Um, but I, I have um, something that God put in my heart uh, over the last uh, few days in light of what we're going through as, as, a, as a nation. And so we're going to go to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to begin in verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost, everybody say Pentecost, Pentecost. arrived, they were all what? Come on, somebody. They were all, thank you. They were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire. Can someone say fire? fire. Appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. Everyone say together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia. Uh, those two uh, places, Egypt and the parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, right? Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them. Everyone, come on somebody, say, we hear them. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed. How many of you think we, we need more amazement in our country? And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said they are filled with new wine. Let's pray. Father, I thank you as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed. I thank you for your grace. Holy Spirit, I believe this is a new day. Holy Spirit, I thank you you're going to change us in ways that we thought were not possible. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are on the move today, Pentecost Sunday. And I just thank you for your energy. I thank you for your grace. I know we bless everyone in this room in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. So I think what we've learned in this pandemic over the last, what, eight, nine weeks is that something, and please hear me today, something is unprecedented until it isn't. Like, for example, I never thought that sports, come on, somebody say sports, that sports would be canceled. Never in my wildest imagination would I ever have uh, dreamed that uh, NCAA football, uh, Major League Baseball, right, all these different, um, the NBA would be canceled. I never thought that was possible. And prior to this pandemic, I would be really honest, honest with you, I thought we had an infinite supply of eggs and toilet paper until we didn't, right? But even though sports were canceled, Lord, thank God for the NFL draft. Can I get an amen to that? Right, I just, our, my man, Curtis Weaver, right, uh, he got drafted. Thank God not to the Dallas Cowboys, uh, but to the Dolphins. And, uh, man, we're so proud of you. We're going to pray God's blessing over you. We're going to pray an injury-free career, a career where God uses you in an amazing way. 
But hey, please hear me. Prior to this pandemic, I thought we had eggs and toilet paper, and then they were gone. My question today is this. If we now believe in pandemics, why can't we believe in Pentecost? See, we all, we all used to think, I'll try to talk here, but we all used to think pandemics were unprecedented. Now we know that we were wrong. So my challenge for the church people here today is to believe that God can do what everyone thought was impossible. And that is to pour out his spirit in a fresh way. Because they've told us, am I preaching too hard this morning? Because they've told us a move of God is impossible in the secular West. They've told us churches are irrelevant. We've seen the data. And the data tells us that the church is in decline. And they've told us for centuries that God is dead from Voltaire and Nietzsche and all these post-enlightenment thinkers. But we always, as a remember, we always thought that we would have toilet paper until we didn't. And on this Pentecost Sunday, I want us to believe for an incredible move of God in our country. In fact, the premise of a recent book on the last five great awakenings is that they all have one thing in common. That is a precursor to every five great awakenings is a national crisis. And in light of our national, are you hearing me this morning? In light of our national crisis, I do not think it is a coincidence that it is Pentecost Sunday. I don't, you could call me crazy, but I don't think that yesterday's wind was, a mere, was merely a coincidence. Remember, a mighty rushing wind blew through the apostles. I don't even think it's a coincidence that the cities in our country are on fire. Because 2,000 years ago, on Pentecost, tongues of fire fell on the disciples of Jesus. Please hear me, I think the Satan, the original arsonist, knows that the Spirit of God is coming back to our nation. He knows that the Spirit of God is coming back to our churches and coming back to our cities. And all the Satan can do is parody the fire of Pentecost. And he does it by, destroy, by destroying lives. So I hope you're hearing me this morning. I'm getting a little dizzy. I don't know what that is. We'll just say that's the Holy Spirit. But this is our historical moment. History, I know this is such a silly little cliche, but yes, it is true more than ever. History is being written right now. It's being made. And I'm speaking now to all the church people. This is our hour. Please hear me. This is our hour. Jesus is calling us out of our complacency. He's calling us out of our sin. He's calling us out of our indifference. He's calling us out of our hate. And he's pouring out his spirit on his people. We come to Acts chapter 2. And here we have the day of Pentecost. It is not a homogeneous event where the spirit falls on only one nation or tribe or ethnic group. The spirit is given, and what happens? There is wind and there is fire. And that wind and that fire from the Holy Spirit is not for our personal fulfillment. Wind and fire from God is not just about an experience. The spirit is given, and then what happens? The nations of the world are reached. So this is what Luke is telling us in Acts chapter 2, that God has come down and has reversed the confusion of Babel and the nations in Genesis chapter 11. And it's through the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus that the spirit is given and the people groups of the world are reconciled. Okay, are you ready for this? 
Pentecost is a racist nightmare. Pentecost, in other words, is a nightmare for all those who want to stoke the flames of injustice and division and isolation. You see, the satanic vision is obviously anti-Pentecost. The Satan's vision is a dystopian nightmare, one where people are divided and isolated. But Pentecost is the opposite. It is the realization of God's vision for creation and is structured around the healing and the reconciliation of the world back to Jesus. We find in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9, and it shows us a vivid picture of this new heavens, new earth reality. And in it, what do you see? You see people from every tribe and tongue and nation praising the Lamb of God. So Pentecost, please hear me. Pentecost and this new heavens, new earth reality, yes, is anti-Satan. And yes, it is anti-racist. And yes, it is anti-division. Pentecost, in other words, is about justice. And the justice of God is about reconciliation. So we come to a few passages. I just want to show you what the justice of God looks like. I'm going to go to the Old Testament. And there are three passages beginning in Jeremiah chapter 9 that show us uh, God's relationship with this world. Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24, read like this. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man, how many mighty men do we have here? Right, we got some good men, right? But we're not going to boast in our might and strength. And I'm pretty strong, guys. I know, you, you know, you, you recognize. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him, and I think this is a prophetic message to the United States of America in particular to the church in the Western world. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and that he knows me, that I'm the Lord, what? Who practices steadfast love, that's hesed in the Hebrew, justice, that's mishpat in the Hebrew, and righteousness, that is zedekah in the Hebrew, in all the earth. For in these things, I love this, this is the Lord saying, I delight. I delight in righteousness, justice, and steadfast love. Uh, Psalm, excuse me, not Psalm, but we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 10. It says, for the Lord your God is the God of gods. Can I get an amen, church? And he is the Lord of lords, the great and the mighty and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice. Could you say justice? For the fatherless and the widow. And he loves the sojourner giving him food and clothing. Verse 19, love therefore, because this is who God is, love the sojourner. Therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Psalm 146 says this, verse 7, God who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up, everyone say lift up. He lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. And the Lord watches. I love this. The Lord watches over the soldier. The Lord watches over the broken. The Lord watches over the sufferer. The Lord watches over, come on somebody. Those who are hurting. The Lord watches over the anxious heart. The Lord watches over those who have been victims of racism. The Lord watches over all people. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked, the way of the wicked, he brings the ruin. In the next few weeks, I'm going to talk about the anger of God regarding justice. It's going to be so good. Please come back next week. There could be see a lot of fire. I'm a redhead, so I'm fiery, right? So who knows what's going to happen as we talk about God's, God's anger. These biblical passages that we just read, 
reveal how the prophets saw God's relationship to the cosmos. And it is characterized by being absolutely and completely devoted to steadfast love, justice, and righteousness. In fact, God says, I delight, right? The word delight means to be bent towards. So God is bent toward loving us every single day. God is bent towards the making of justice in our nation. He is bent towards righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is well-ordered relationships. Righteousness is relationships that are defined by human flourishing, right, and togetherness and reconciliation. It is these attributes that form the essential character of God. In fact, they characterize or define God's dynamic living care for the world. So justice, please hear me this morning. Justice and righteousness, which I wish I could talk more about this, but I can't, which in their noun forms are virtually synonymous, are not, are not, are not a Republican or a liberal thing. They are not first concepts that belong to a neo-Marxist group or to the French literary movement that want to de deconstruct everything, right? Justice and righteousness first, right, are God's. They belong to him. And this is important. If we don't connect justice with Jesus, human history shows us that justice eventually grows corrupt and spoils itself and turns to bloodlust. Why? Why, 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 why? Why does that happen, Chris? Well, justice is not something we project onto God because we humans are just. Let me break it to you. There's no one in this room that is perfectly just. I don't know. I just, I don't like Washington Redskins fans because I'm a Cowboys fan and I want vengeance and blood, right? I know my heart. You know your heart. The whole of the Bible tells us that justice is rather theomorphic, which simply means that humans want justice and desire justice because God is just. So God is the God of justice and righteousness. And the Bible doesn't over-spiritualize justice and righteousness by making the claim that God is unconcerned about the social dimensions of life, like our body and our health and laws and racism and the exploitation of people. No, God's justice is not a disembodied, empty reality which has nothing to do with our daily and practical lives. Are you hearing me? I need some help this morning because I'm getting tired. Yes, justice is, please hear me, First, a spiritual problem. Human folly and human wickedness are not just mistakes people make. Sin is a singular spiritual power that has spoiled the human heart. The human heart is unrecognizable based on how God made it because of the singular power. And it's affected everyone in this room. It's affected everyone in this world. But the spiritual problem, please hear me, also has social implications. Some people, remember the meme yesterday when uh, NASA and SpaceX got the, the rocket, right? And like four, how many astronauts flew up into, into space? Two. Some of us think that's what Christianity is. It's a get me out of the craziness. Let's leave Earth, Right? Unfortunately, we've conceptualized justice as, okay, a disembodied thing, it's going to heaven, and in heaven God will make all things right. Now, we believe in heaven, but more importantly, justice is for this world. If Jesus then is for justice, then we are called to be for justice. This week, my wife I was actually writing and studying. My wife took our big three, Wesley, Quincy, Whitney, to a table. And uh, it was when we heard of the news of George Floyd uh, dying. And uh, it was heartbreaking. And I know my wife, she did an incredible job. She gave a theological lesson to our kids. She walked them through um, their frustration, we showed parts of, the, my wife showed parts of the video to them, and I was like in the back writing and overhearing what my wife was saying, checking her theology and all of that. <laughs> By the way, she is a incredible theologian, my God. I can't wait for her to preach. I mean, she's the best preacher in this church, I mean. Um, but she was talking to our kids, and um, my kids were outraged and sad all at the same time. 
don't know if you know this, but psychologists tell us that anger and sadness mirror each other. So wherever you see anger, behind that is sadness. And wherever you see sadness, behind that is what? Anger, right? They mirror each other. That is what our nation is experiencing. In fact, um, we had to walk you through a Quincy few, a few, few things. Uh, my wife did it, and I kind of came um, to encourage my son. Uh, but he was outraged, right, over what had happened. Now, let me say this really quick. Um, we... We believe in our police officers. We have incredible police officers, even in this church. From Steve Martinez, Joe Martinez, Matt, who's on the front row. They, they are in, incredible. However, are there bad actors? Yeah. And it's important that we speak truth to uh, power. Can I get an amen? In the light of these passages, how do you think, and this is what I, as as you're kind of thinking through what I'm talking about, as it relates to my son who was absolutely outraged and sad over what happened to George Floyd, in light of these passages, how do you think God feels about George, can we name him, George Floyd? I don't know. Like, we, we think we're more moral than God sometimes. It is weird. Some of us think that we're more outraged and sad over situations than God is. So let me ask you this question. In light of the justice and righteousness of God, which are essentialized in his beingness, how does God fill? Well, let me just say this really quick. One biblical scholar states, man's sense of injustice is a poor analogy to God's sense of injustice. Injustice to us is a misdemeanor. To God, it's a disaster. The murder of George Floyd is a disaster to God. Racism is a disaster to God. Division is a disaster to God. You know what also is a disaster? It's a disaster when the people of God do not consider disasters to be disastrous. Any act of injustice, in particular racism, is a violation of God's chesed and love and righteousness and justice. And we will name it here at Capital Church. It is satanic. It is anti-God. It is anti-human. It is anti-Jesus. It is anti-creation. It is anti-Pentecost. It is anti-the Holy Spirit. It is anti-church. This morning I was praying, as, as I do every morning, but this morning I woke up just a little bit earlier, and the Holy Spirit put this in my heart. If we are not moved by the heart of God, we cannot have a move of God. If we are not moved by the heart of God today, we cannot have a move of God. I want to remind us, as I kind of land this plane, who knows, I might be another four hours, who knows. I want to remind us that Jesus was moved for uh, compassion for the hungry crowd. I love that statement. He was moved. The literal translation of the word compassion is that the, ba this is, it's a little graphic, a little crazy, but the bowels of Jesus were moved. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's kind of, man, that's deep. Right, that's, man, that's deep stuff. The heart of Jesus is moved over the hunger of the people, right? They're like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion. Jesus starts with compassion. And that compassion flows into action. We can call this action justice for the people for food. And then what happens as Jesus is moved with compassion, he's then moved into action, which is justice. And then guess what happens? A miracle takes place. I got to say, I wonder if the reason why we don't experience miracles, could it be we have lost our feels and our compassion for people? It just seems like compassion is the energy of miracles in the public ministry of Jesus. This word compassion in the Greek is closely related to the Hebrew word for compassion we find in Isaiah chapter 54 verse 7. I don't know if we have this passage. Yes. This is what God says for a brief moment, I deserted you but with great, could you say that word, compassion. 
I will gather you. The word compassion is translated womb. One scholar states, the prophets are calling God womish. I have preached this many times before, but compassion describes how a mom or a dad feels for their child. Right? If you're a parent here, you know there is something visceral in your heart for your kids, even when they're just stinkers, right? You love them to infinity, right? That's what defines the relationship between specifically a mom and her child or a dad with his kids. It's funny, this last week, I, uh, I um, was kind of hanging out at my house and uh, my older two boys, Q and Wes, were outside. They were cleaning up and uh, they were throwing the football. And I came out and there were some teenagers. Man, I, God bless our teenagers. They're amazing. But these teenagers, they were messing with my kids. And so they were talking trash to them, saying stuff, right? And so I look at my son, and then I look at these teenagers. I'm not going to get into what I said. You probably would leave the church, but sort of kidding. Uh, I said something. I blacked out. I don't know what happened to me. And, you know, they, they sized me up, and they knew they had no chance. And God is my witness. There was a, fero there was a, what's a ferociousness inside of me, and I said, you better leave right now, after a few other sentences. <laughs> and God is my witness, these teenagers, because they recognize authority, right? They ran. That's compassion flowing with justice. That experience that I felt as a dad with my kids is how God feels with everyone in this room. The compassion of Jesus complements the justice of Jesus. They do not compete. So as we close, what does justice look like? For a start, a bad reason for doing justice is to get something out of it. Bad reason for doing justice is to satisfy our need for revenge or bloodlust. A bad reason for justice is, ah, I'm going to be a justice person because everyone else is posting about it on Instagram. And don't get me stinking started about Instagram, right? Now, I love Instagram, and I think we need to post, right? And we can't be silenced about issues related to justice. But I think we, we need to go beyond just to post, people. Let's start there. Can I get an amen? But let's go beyond that. The good reason for doing justice for victims of racism, for our African-American brothers and sisters in Christ for those who are disadvantaged, for the exploited, is because we want to be like Jesus. I don't know, am I preaching too hard this morning? I used to preach like this all the time, and then I just got tired, right? Because Jesus is the God of justice, the church is also called to be a community of justice. I love this, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 13 says, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves are free. In all, everyone say all. 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 So Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, male or female, there, there's no labels. Everything is equal at the foot of the cross. Yes, 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 yes. What is that? That's justice for the people. What is that? That's reconciliation. And all were made to drink of one spirit. At times, justice be that racism or the explo exploitation of the poor or even issues related to mental health. And over the next few weeks, I'm going to be talking about stuff related to justice has been peripheral to the mission of the church. But what we find in, New in the New Testament, that it is front and center in the ministry, the public ministry of Jesus. Jesus, what did he do? He went around announcing, blessed are the poor. Whew. He went around announcing, blessed are those who mourn because the kingdom of God is among you. The justice of Jesus must be front and center in our churches again. How does that happen? You with me? First, being people of God who follow Jesus in the spirit is learning to identify our concern, our feelings, our action, our thoughts, our worldview with what Jesus is concerned about, what Jesus feels, and how Jesus sees reality. If Jesus is broken over the brokenness in our world, 
shouldn't it our hearts? Yes, no, be broken. Yes, no. Shouldn't we feel as followers of Jesus what Jesus feels? My question here this morning is, are we wrecked over the trauma of racism, idolatry, violence, suffering? Are we moved by the heart of God? Okay, I'm going to confess something. This last week, I have been so stinking wrecked. This morning, I told you I prayed. I sort of prayed. I actually cried for two hours, and I didn't even know I was crying. I'm not a psychopath. I'm not losing my mind or anything like that, right? You know what it is? I, I feel like I am feeling and seeing the heart of God like I've never felt or seen before. In fact, the last four, I didn't tell my wife, we were, we were talking about something theologically. We were talking about several books last night, and we we're kind of going back and forth, and she thought she was owning me, but I was owning her. No, I'm kidding. No, we weren't in an argument or anything like that. And she looked over, and she goes, Chris, what's wrong with your eyes? I'm like, nothing, babe, nothing. I'm going to be real honest with you. I'm right now, as your, as a lead pastor, and both my wife and I have experienced this this week, as your lead pastors this week, we're being wrecked by the Holy Spirit. We are feeling things we haven't felt before. Are you feeling that? Here's the problem. Let me just say this really quick. When it comes to worldview, it's important that your presuppositions are right. Because if you get the wrong presupposition, you go in the wrong direction, and that influences your entire destiny. So why are we talking about that? Well, because I feel like I need to say this right now. Some of us, we have strong political opinions, and that's great. I'm not saying you can't have those strong political opinions. I am probably, I probably have stronger political opinions, right? I am just a stinking redhead, and I just, oh, right? I'm a fiery person. So there's nothing wrong with having a strong political opinion. What's wrong is when we start with our political opinion and we try to move into, the, into theology. That's when you get screwy. That's when you lose your mind. I don't care how coherent your worldview is, if you start with politics, you will always go in the wrong direction. However, if you start with Jesus and really good theology like today, that can inform your politics, that can inform your action, that in turn can inform and influence your destiny, and that can determine whether you will be a human that flourishes or a human that will be deformed by corruption. So, this is what I have to do every single day. I gotta take my political opinions and they're good they're probably not all right, probably 99% of them are right, as a horrible joke, but you all think that. You got to take those political opinions, no matter how great they are, and submit them to Jesus and his justice. Okay. I didn't say this first service, but I'm going to say it here today. The problem when it comes to justice, there are some Christians that like the uh, justice talk is like choppy waters, right? And they don't think it's navigable to get through these, these, these choppy waters. And so what happens is justice can be exploited at times, right? And so because we see the exploitation of justice and the powers who don't care about people, but they just care about making money or benefiting them, right? What happens is because we see that parody of justice, we throw out justice with the bathwater. So rather than understanding that no, justice is not a Republican thing, it's not a liberal thing, a Democrat thing, justice is not a human thing, justice is a God thing, justice is a Jesus thing. And when we start there, that's when we can expose the parodies of justice as exploitative. Can I get an amen? amen? So how do we move? That was just an excursus. Hopefully that blessed you. If it didn't, just forget it. How then do we move into the heart of Jesus as I close? Number one, Pentecost teaches us that we gotta pray. The astonishing thing about Pentecost, which is the new age of the spirit, is that it was started in a prayer meeting. 
I never want to underestimate what prayer can accomplish in us and in this world. C.S. Lewis said prayer is unlimited by space and time. And it's in prayer that we receive the heart of Jesus. So what, what should we do this week? Let's just think about this week. I think we got to get desperate as the people of God. This week, I think, man, if, if prayer drives are your thing, go on a prayer drive. If waking up early, maybe you haven't done it in a while, but you know, maybe I need to wake up in the morning and spend some time with Jesus, do it this week. If your thing is, man, I, I just don't know, I, I, don't, I don't know about prayer, maybe just take your face and put it in your hands after you sanitize them and cry out to Jesus. Maybe come to pre-service prayer on Sunday. I don't know. If you don't know how to pray, find someone who does and pray with them. We can no longer, in light of our national crisis, we can no longer be satisfied with prayerlessness. If we're satisfied with prayerlessness, then we are satisfied with a no move of God. And I promise you, I promise you that Jesus wants to do so much in you as you pray. Second, verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost arrived in chapter 2, they were all together in what? One place or in one accord. In this place today, here's the thing, if we want to move into the heart of God and we want to see a move of God, we must come together. Our hearts must be united around Jesus and his heart for our city. Can I get an amen? If it isn't, how do we expect a move of God in our country? If we can't come together around Jesus and his heart for our city, how can God move? The great 19th century preacher once said, Charles Spurgeon, the Holy Spirit did not bring unity, but the Holy Spirit was poured out because there was unity. If we want a move of God, we must be serious about uniting our hearts around Jesus and his living care for the city. I'm almost done. Third, our relationship to unjust acts should never just be contemplative. It must also be cooperative. This means that we, we need to move from, let's start with post and let's start with talking and having a conversation. But man, we have to move from that into cooperation with the spirit and justice of God. This means we just don't think about the spirit and have conversations about the spirit and justice stuff. We also participate with Jesus and his justice for the people. So what does this look like locally, right? When, sometimes if we're not careful, when we start talking about justice, we get exhausted because we're like, there's just way too many stinking problems out there. What am I supposed to do? Well, Jesus gives us the answer in Luke chapter 10, and he gives us a profile of a just and unjust person. Verse 30, Jesus replied to the question, who is my neighbor? And he tells a story. And he says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by. Could you say passed by? On the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw, everyone say when he saw. He saw him, and he had compassion. And then he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and they took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these, Jesus then asks, of these three, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Verse 37, he said, the one who showed him mercy. And then Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So the profile of an unjust person is to see a problem and to pass by. It's to see a problem and to do nothing about it. Oh, such and such will take care of that. Oh, they'll take care of that. When you see a problem and do nothing, Jesus calls that unjust, unjust. Perhaps these two men, right? I don't know. They, uh, after they saw the man on the side of the road, left to die, maybe they went home and they talked about it. I don't know. 
Maybe they blogged about it. Who knows? But here we have the profile of the just person. And here we see the good Samaritan. He sees a problem. He acts in compassion. And this profile of a just person is defined by a willingness to be inconvenienced without any return of benefits. That's justice. Spending a couple days with a person you've never met before to make sure that they're okay, that's justice. That's justice. It's when we act in compassion and we're willing to be disadvantaged for those who are disadvantaged. So following Jesus means when we see an unjust act as a community, I want to, I want to encourage us, let's act. When we see someone in need, let's act. When you see something that violates the heart of Jesus, what should we do? Let's act. I don't want to be a church any longer that passes by those who are disadvantaged. You see, the transformative, as we close, the transformative genius of the early church was not in its power, and the early church was powerful. The transformative genius of the church was not in its miracles, and it had a lot of miracles. The transformative genius of the early church in the first three to four centuries, wherein they transformed the Roman power, was found in, their, in the ways in which they practically loved people. So finally, our way of life seeing a problem, acting in compassion, and being willing to inconvenience ourselves, right? That way of life is the byproduct of Jesus who inconvenienced himself for us. He gave up his life, please hear me this morning as I close, for the sins of the world. Jesus gave up his life for our sins. The Bible declares that not only did Jesus defeat death through his death, but the death of Jesus was also the first signs of justice, of God putting this broken world to rights. Can I get an amen, church? Let's pray. As your eyes are closed, your heads are bowed, I'm gonna pray a prayer over, over you. We can't have you come up to the front. I would love to do that. We'll do that a couple weeks down the road. But if you want to be a justice person, if you want the heart of God for, for the city, if you want God to do a fresh work in you this morning on Pentecost Sunday, if you want to be a part of the next great awakening in our country, I would like you to stand this morning. I'm going to pray over you. As you stand, can you take your hand and put on your heart? This is a prayer of discomfort. Close your eyes. Father, today I pray that you would bless us today with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within your heart. I pray that, God, you would bless us with righteous anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. God, I ask that you would bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer pain and rejection, hunger, and war so that we may reach out, or that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us this morning on Pentecost Sunday with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all of our children, to the poor, to the victims of racism, in Jesus' name. So I pray as our eyes are closed for George Floyd's family bring them comfort. I think he has a six-year-old daughter, as he would be with him, the family, he would be with her. I pray for God's justice. Lord, we pray that you would give us your heart for those who have experienced unjust acts. 
Lord, I also ask that we would be a people for healing, reconciliation. I ask today on this Pentecost Sunday that we would be people of action and not passivity. And finally, I thank you that, man, if pandemics can happen, so can a fresh outpouring of the Spirit of God. And I ask right now that you would pour out your Spirit in this church and that you would pour out your Spirit in this city and that you would pour out your Spirit across the land in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.